Okay, everybody, this is, a, this is Kieran from Leicestershire Care speaking. You're joining us. We are going to be starting in about a minute or so. We should appear on the screen. We're using StreamYard, which means if you've got questions, you need to type them because we, you can't ask questions directly on this format. We are recording this session as well. Be aware of that. But you can put an anonymous name on if you type a question. If you don't want your name to go out, we're quite happy for you to do that. As I say, in a, a minute or two, Rakesh and I will appear on the screen and then that's when the actual session will start. So, you know, get yourself a cup of tea, relax and get ready for what we hope is going to be a really enlightening and informative webinar. Okay, everybody, just again, if you're joining. Oh, okay. Hi. So, my name is Kieran Breen. I'm the CEO of Leicestershire Cares, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Rakesh Rajani, who I'll let Rakesh tell you about himself. What I can say about Rakesh is I've known him for, I think, about 20 years, and he was an outstanding civil society leader in Tanzania and Africa before going off to America. And I think it's true to say he is now an international thought leader, and I'm sure he's too modest to share that with you. But Rakesh, if I give you the floor, you could perhaps just introduce yourself, give a little bit of context, and then tell us a bit about international perspectives on Build Back Better and what's been going on in the world. And if we give you sort of 20, 20 odd minutes to have a chat, and then we'll go into questions. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Kieran, for, for this invitation. And, and hello, everyone. I'm really, really glad to be here and, and sharing with you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Rakesh Rajani. I'm Tanzanian uh, and I've spent most of my life in East Africa, except for the last uh, six years I've been in the, in the US. Um, for about, um, once I finished university for about 25 years, I worked on issues of uh, children's rights, uh, education and governance how are governments working for people? Um, and then in the last six years, I have been living in New York, um, where my wife is from, working on what uh, you in the US is known as philanthropy, first for the Ford Foundation and now for an organization for, called Co-Impact, where we really are trying to get systems to work better for, for people. And, and as you'll see, that's something I believe in very, very strongly. I met uh, Kieran long ago when, when, when he was working for VSO in, in, in Tanzania and uh, learned a lot from him. So it's really nice to reconnect. And I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to your questions and the discussion that we will have together. So thank you again for this kind invitation. Do you want me to jump right in, Kieran? Yeah, so we have Rakesh, if you take it away. Great, thank you. All right. so. COVID is a global pandemic, meaning it has affected all of us in the north and south of the world, in east and west, rich and poor, women and men, white, brown and black people. No one has been spared from this pandemic. And in many ways, it's biblical in its kind of proportions. It's like perhaps a metaphor we can use here is that there's a flood. There's been a flood that has affected all of us that we are all battling. But while we battle this flood, we are not all in the same boat. Some of us have life rafts. Others are struggling to tread water. At best, they might have a plastic jerry can to hold on to. Whereas some of us are in yachts, are in very luxurious yachts and are doing very fine during the pandemic, if anything, are doing better than they were before. Like I said, I'm a Tanzanian, but presently live in New York City. Last night, while I was waiting to catch my train to come back home, I saw a post poster at the Grand Central Terminal in New York City, which said, um, 
come in to get your vaccine shots. And if you do so, we will give you a free pass for a week to take the trains. Next door in the state of New Jersey, if you now sign up to get a vaccine, you get a $100 voucher. In the state of Ohio, if you get, if in order to encourage you to get a vaccine, you will get a lottery ticket and every week one person will win a million dollars. These are all incentives to cajole you to get the vaccine. But back home in Tanzania, not a single dose of the vaccine has been administered today for any of the more than 50 million people who live in this country. You will be familiar with the percentages in the UK. I'm told that there are 56% who've been vaccinated. In India, it is 11%. Across Africa, it is less than 2% on average, and in most countries, way below 1%. The primary reason for this inequality is not because we do not have the vaccine technology, and not even because we do not have enough vaccines. It is rather about who has access to them, who is entitled to them. Today in the world, we do not have a vaccine problem. We have an inequality problem. As Amartya Sen, the, the noted um, Indian and British philosopher and economist has shown us around famines, that famines are not caused by lack of food. In fact, during the worst famines in Ethiopia in those same years, food production had in fact gone up. There was more food produced so what caused the famines was not lack of food, but rather lack of entitlements as to who was entitled to those food and who was not. If a year ago, the world had decided, the world's leaders had decided, let's make sure we design a system that would make sure that everyone in the world will have vaccines, we could have done so. We could have had a system where today, in May 2021, we would have had everyone in the world at least have 50% access to vaccines. But instead, we have the deep differences that I pointed out, where some people are doing very well and others are literally having to beg to survive. And many, many people are suffering and dying, uh, most prominently in India today. But we've had the same situation across the world in other countries, in Brazil, in Latin America, across Africa, and so forth. In other words, the experience of this pandemic, while it affects all of us, varies deeply based on who we are in society and how the rules of the game are structured and what is our lot in society. Billionaire wealth during the, COVID vaccine, during the times of COVID has actually increased significantly. People like Jeff Bezos are significantly more wealthier, as are many, many other billionaires during the COVID period, during the same time in which hundreds of millions of people are barely surviving and many are dying. In that way, COVID has been like an X-ray to show not new inequalities, but the inequalities that we have always had. And, and the key point we need to understand is how we are faring during the pandemic today is determined not by the decisions that we are making today, primarily, but it is determined by the structure of society that we had before the pandemic. All the pandemic does is reveal and exacerbate the inequalities that we have always had. Now, let me uh, highlight three challenges, three inequalities that will be familiar with all of you, but I think it's useful to go through them. So number one, Women have disproportionately borne the burden and the pain of the pandemic in every single country of the world. Life has been hard for women because the way society and economy are structured has been hard on women. In families and communities, women do the bulk of caregiving. So women, when people get sick, women disproportionately take care of the sick. When schools are closed due to lockdowns, the work of homeschooling and home care falls disproportionately on women. When childcare centers are closed or simply not available, childcare falls on women. When there is a crisis because both the husband and the wife are laid off work and or their shop that they run is not doing normal business, it is women who have to disproportionately figure out how are we going to feed the family. When there is a higher mental health burden, 
because of COVID and, and people dying and people suffering and the precariousness of life, and when the emotional needs of teenage kids are really, really hard, when elderly people are struggling, again, it is women who disproportionately bear the burden of taking care of that. And we know that when it comes to caregiving professions, the nurses, the caregivers in elderly homes, the teachers, the cleaners, the domestic workers, it is women who form the majority of these professions. The entire society depends on women to survive and make it through. And yet it is these same women who are the least paid, the least protected, the least valued and respected, and the least able to realize their rights. Across the world, we are recognizing the contribution of the caregiving profession and the women in the caregiving professions. And in some countries, there are more articles and we bang pots and pans at 7 p.m. to appreciate them. But nothing much has changed structurally, whether it is for the nurse who took care of Boris Johnson or for the Ashas and the Angadwari workers in deep rural India or Liberia or Bolivia or pick any country in the world who are helping us survive through this pandemic. The COVID X-ray has revealed what we should have always known, how the inequality between men and women and how the inequality in gender norms is unfair and has real life consequences. But what makes life doubly or triply unfair is that the systems we have, the public systems, the rules of the game, if you will, the very systems that are supposed to help us make it through crises, and do well, these very systems, in fact, further exacerbate and reflect these inequalities. In the United States, for example, there are no federal laws for paid leave or maternity care or sick leave. So when you are suffering and caring and dying, you are on your own. You have to beg the Walmart or Amazon bosses for a few hours off. And before you even ask for those few hours, to take care of your child or your elderly mother, uh, you, you are thinking twice, should I even ask? Because even asking might make me fired or might make me seen by my bosses as not committed to work. In many other countries like my country, Tanzania or in India, you have laws, but those laws only apply to the formal sector that employ less than one in 20 women. So 19 out of 20 women are not protected by those laws. And because these laws do not apply, for example, to the informal sector, where disproportionately more women work. You navigate all these burdens while facing all the same discriminations that you have always faced, except these discriminations now just make life even harder. The cat calls as you walk down the street, or the sexual harassment in the workplace or in public transport when you get onto that crowded bus and you have men feeling you up, thinking that is cool and okay to do, or the violence at home you face from your father or your husband or your brother. As you all know, data has shown that violence against women has increased significantly during the pandemic everywhere in the world. These realities, these inequalities do not just happen. They happen by design. They happen because they are designed to happen. They happen because discrimination and inequality are baked into our public and private systems. The very systems that are meant to protect us, to help take care of us, end up hurting some of us disproportionately. They end up hurting women and black and brown people and countries in the global south much more, and they reinforce that very inequality. It doesn't have to be this way. The rules of the game could be set up very differently. We could have laws that mandate and enforce equal pay for equal work. Rules that recognize that caregiving is work, right? Caregiving is infrastructure. It is work that is vital to the health of our society and should be compensated fairly, just like an office in the uh, job in the offices. Leave policy should be designed with gendered considerations centrally in mind. Laws and mechanisms can be designed to take violence against women more seriously to help prevent it in the first place and to make sure that where it happens, every woman knows she is not alone and will get the practical help she absolutely deserves right away, no questions asked. For all these, 
rules could be made. Countries could make rules that apply to the informal sector as much as to the formal sector, recognizing that's where you find real people and that's why you find many more women. <clears throat> Important, I think, for us to also recognize that one of the core reasons these gender inequalities persist is because women are locked out of leadership and out of decision making. Women face barriers to entry into jobs and opportunities. Once they make it into institutions, they face unequal treatment and fewer opportunities and supports to thrive, fewer opportunities to set the agenda, to make decisions, because they are locked out of senior leadership and board governance. Look at the photographs of world leaders or of finance ministers or of high court judges or boards or of C-suites in corporations and they will all look very, very male to you. In all of Africa, 54 countries, and there is only one female political head of state, less than 2%. Happens to be in my country, and that only happened because our misogynist male president was a COVID denialist and, and was killed by COVID. What does that mean that in 2021, you only have one out of 54 countries that are led by women? If you go to India during political campaigns, you see these large billboards of the kind of slate of candidates from a coalition or a political party. And you might find 25 photographs of leaders and you will be lucky if one or two of those 25 are women. And typically the woman will be would be designated to be in charge of the docket with the least budget. When women are not at the table where decisions are made, before COVID, during COVID, and in the building back after COVID or during COVID, we should not be surprised that systems continue to be discriminatory. Representation matters. If we care about a fair and healthy recovery, a fair and healthy building back better, then we need to pay close attention to who is in charge, who is setting the agenda, who is making the rules and enforcing them. Second, virtually everything that I have said about women, about gender inequality, I could also say about class and race inequality too. So let's focus on race for a moment. In the United States, black Americans are twice as likely to get sick and die from COVID than white Americans. And as Bradley Hardy and Trevor Logan of the Brookings Institution, a think tank, a kind of mainstream think tank point, point out, and I'll quote, the outsized challenges that black Americans are facing are a reflection of the generally diminished economic position and health status that they face prior to this crisis. Several pre-COVID-19 economic conditions, including lower, lower levels of income and wealth, higher unemployment, and greater levels of food and housing insecurity, leave black families with fewer buffers to absorb economic shocks and contribute to black households' vulnerability to the COVID-19 economic crisis. The interaction of these pre-COVID-19 economic and health disparities, including a higher rate of pre-existing health conditions such as hypertension and lung disease, has contributed to higher COVID-19 mortality rates for black Americans." End quote. Again, it is the way society and economy is organized before the pandemic that shapes and structures how we are going to deal with this pandemic. And if we want to build back better, we have to pay attention to these very ways in which economy and society is structured. In the United Kingdom, you will know way better than me, but I see that the data is the same. Mortality risk from COVID is twice as high for black and South Asian groups compared to white groups. In a recent paper in the British Medical Journal, an article by M. Razai and his colleagues say, and I quote, uh, this startling fact, although black and Asian staff represent only 21% of the NHS work workforce, the National Health Service workforce, early analysis has shown that they account for 63% of deaths among health and social care workers. Let me repeat that. They represent only 21% of the NHS workforce, but they accounted for three times as much, 63% of the deaths among health and social workers. 
That very paper goes on to show how structural racism across society in relation to schooling, jobs, housing, public health, treatment by police, etc. All things that have been structured before the pandemic directly contribute to the disproportionate impact of COVID on society. In India, reliable data of this sort is harder to come by, partly because the government is making every, you know, is doing everything possible to, to make that data hard to get and collect and get. There is no question that people from lower caste Dalit communities are disproportionately affected. Um, when anecdotally, uh, my upper class, middle class, wealthier colleagues complain about being stuck in their homes, not being able to get reliable vaccines, how life has ground to a halt, and how hospitals are overwhelmed. And yes, some of my wealthier and middle class friends have gotten sick and some have died. But that is nothing compared to the situation of migrant laborers and the rural poor who have no infrastructure to speak of. They don't even complain about oxygen not being available in hospitals because oxygen was never available in rural India to begin with. India spends little over 1% of its GDP on health, essentially privatizing healthcare, saying to people that when it comes to health, you're on your own. If you have the money, buy your way to getting the healthcare. And if you don't have the money, tough. For the vast majority of people in India, in the largest, the most populated country in the world, you are on your own when it comes to dealing with the COVID crisis. Third, I could go and speak about other forms. We could talk about class. We could talk about disability. We could talk about sexual identity and ways in which LGBTQ communities are, are disproportionately affected, including in countries where it is illegal to be LGBT. But I want to end by my here by talking about uh, um, the point around intersectionality. I'm not so familiar with how, I'm not sure how familiar that term may be in the UK, but I think it is really important if there's one lesson we should learn from COVID, it is around intersectionality, meaning that any one of the discriminations we face based on being on gender or race or caste is huge. But when these compound, the impact can be devastating. In the UK or the US, women face multiple barriers and burdens, but black or South Asian women who are immigrants with low income face a triple whammy. These discriminations compound like compound interest does, not only in ways that are additive and linear, but that are just overwhelming that can change your life course forever. It can mean that you will deal today with a storm at best, by holding on to that plastic jerry can, you will not even have a, a, a life jacket. You will let alone a, a raft, let alone a boat, let alone something more secure. So we do need to pay attention to the structure of discrimination. And the key point, if we think now, what does this all mean, is that none of these things have to be this way. The inequality and suffering in the world we have is man-made. And because it is man-made, humans can design a very different system going forward, systems that are much more inclusive and responsive and effective. I use this word systems deliberately because in my view, it is not about charity or special assistance during a crisis. It's not about how we all come together and, and, and take, take food to the food bank, though that can be necessary and helpful. Because charity cannot address root causes. Perhaps all private individuals and private families can do is to give the sort of immediate support and welfare that we need, but that is not sustainable and cannot reach the scale we need. That can only be a band-aid. And it is also not fair to throw that burden back onto individuals, families and individual people and single moms and elderly people living on their own. This is a societal problem and requires a societal or systemic level society, uh, response. In other words, we need public systems to work better. In the United Kingdom, perhaps the key reason your vaccination program with all its problems has been relatively good compared to many other countries is because you have a national health service. 
then because you invested in it over decades, because now you're, the GP has a database of people. You don't need to create a new system. You can reach out to those people. In Liberia, where we co-impact, my organization has a program with the Ministry of Health and an amazing organization called Last Mile Health, the impact of COVID has been relatively limited because of the health system that was put in place in response to Ebola. And because the response to Ebola was not band-aid, but to make a health system work, to make sure community health assistance are proximate and nearby to help communities systemically deal with their public health needs. When COVID hit, that system was in place and was able to respond and help people respond to COVID in ways that have made sure that the impact of COVID is relatively limited and people have the supports they need. So in closing, how do we build back better? Instead of me giving you the answers, I hope we can make that a discussion. I hope that you will not only ask questions, but you will come up with suggestions of what we can do. Because you are much better placed to know your context than I do, and therefore much better placed to know what solutions we need. But I want to suggest to you that it won't just happen because the people in charge, because the leaders in Leicester or the leaders at the, in London or the leaders anywhere are going to take care of this. Left to their own devices, the leaders will not take care of this. They will only do the right thing if people make them do the right thing. In the US now, we have a president, whatever one thinks of him, he is doing many of the right things, not because Joe Biden is a great individual. He may be a great individual, but Joe Biden is doing the right thing on many of these things because people have organized for years to make sure that whoever is in government does the right thing. So what does it take to do the right thing? I want to leave you with three points, three hypotheses that I think are need to be critical factors if we want to build back better. Number one, our core problem is distributional. It is one of discrimination and exclusion by gender, by race, by class. It is about who has power and who is left out of, squeezed out of power. So any building back better must make inclusion its central concern. Point two, representation matters. If we want to build back better with justice, with equity, to make sure all of us benefit, not only the privilege, then decision-making at all levels needs to reflect society. We need to ask, is there gender parity on our boards and our C-suites? Are black and brown people adequately represented? Do we have the perspectives of the less elite, the less posh, the working class people? And are our systems of recruitment and promotion and support focused on correcting for historical inequities? If anything, if we want to make something better, we should have a higher representation and over representation of historically disadvantaged groups in decision making, in power than we have, than, than their proportion in society. We should perhaps have not only 50% women on boards, we should have 75% women on boards perhaps. We should not only have the representation of black and brown people that is reflected in society, if we want to correct for historical inequities, perhaps we should have greater present representation. And finally, third, while individuals and communities can come together and should come together to take care of each other, I suggest to you that the most important engagement we need to do is with government. Because historically, in societies, in large societies, private actions and community actions can only take you so far. It is only when governments work better for people, when governments set up public systems to work for people that we can take care of things. In India, they have no national health service. You have lots of community uh, service and you have lots of private hospitals. And you see the suffering in India today and you see how 
no level of private and community effort can make up for the lack of a national health service. So similarly then, when communities come together to take care of each other, the greatest responsibility we have is to make sure that government works better for people, that it looks like the people, it reflects people's priorities, it is responsive to people, it is accountable to people. Because only then will we have a more sustainable solution to COVID and all the other challenges that life will throw our way. So with that, let me stop here. I'm really excited to listen to your, your thoughts, your comments, and your questions. Over let me back you, on. Hi, everybody. So Holly, I've, so people, if you were hearing this and you put some questions in the question bar, but I'm, I'm going to start off with one that's come up. And you, you were talking about excluded groups. And one question, Rakesh, is the world increasingly divided between young and old? There seems to be a lot of evidence that, you know, older people, you know, got a bit of money, a bit conservative, young people facing a very tough time. And there is an age divide which political parties are spotting and playing into. Is this an issue? Is the world becoming a world of young and old? And how do we overcome that? I, I think it is it is an issue. I think it's an issue in in different ways in different countries. So it doesn't play out exactly in the same way, but it is an issue. And I think this this very much goes to how the rules are structured. So, for example, um, why why are older people wealthier than younger people in in hugely stark terms? I'm not talking about just two x or three x wealthy. I just mean uh, you know. Older, wealthier people have just just inordinate more money in certain societies than in than in others, and that has to do with the rules of the game. It has to do with, for example, what is the structure of taxation. It has to do with uh, services. In the United States, for example, um, when you go to college, you take on a loan. You you might leave, finish your university education, just your bachelor's degree. With a with a with a debt of two hundred thousand dollars, which you will be paying for the rest of your life, which will mean, for example, that even if you wanted to be a social worker, you may not choose to become a social worker because you know that on a social worker wage, you will never be able to pay back your debt, and that debt compounds with interest. So it's like, it's like biblical again. The debt you will never get out of that debt. So I think that is it is the structured way in which society is organized uh, that leads it. Now, in other, I don't want to say that life is all rosy for older people. There are many societies where elderly people are also struggling. They tend to be poorer elderly people. They tend to be disproportionately black or brown. That's the point around intersectionality. So I think the, the question becomes, we need to understand how are the rules of the game organized? How can we change those around who is entitled to what services and opportunities? what happens to taxation, what happens to what can give you a fair start in society for young people. And we absolutely can redesign our societies to give young people a fair chance in life. Okay, we've got a another question here from Anna, and she wants to know, what, what, what what's the role of the business sector? And most people seem to agree business, government, community should work together, but what is the role of the business sector? So I think, I think with the, business sector there are there are two big roles that come to mind one is to understand that they are part of society they are part of community and what can they do to join with efforts to help out right so there is a lot of corporate social responsibility there's a lot of volunteering that you can do there's a lot of donations that corporates can make they can be part of the solution in terms of the uh, you know, how we are trying to deal with the pandemic in, men, in multiple ways, you know, organizing their hours differently, organizing the flexibility around rules differently, and so forth. That's one thing. It's often the most visible. It's often the most tangible ways in which uh, business can be helpful. But I think the far more effective way in which business can be part of this is how they help make sure that they set up rules of the game that are truly fair for society. So again, we have, think of some of the biggest businesses in the world, like Amazon, like FedEx, uh, like uh, Google. Those companies virtually pay no taxes. They earn billions of dollars, but they can actually hide their money in tax havens. They can actually ha hire a battery of lawyers to make sure that even though they are making billions, right, 
Kieran, you and I probably paid more in taxes as individuals, right, than Amazon did. Now, just think about that for a moment, right? Why is the biggest, richest company in the world one of the, you know, paying less in taxes than individuals? There is something fundamentally wrong about that. So when companies work to rig the system, if you will, in their favor, if they use their lobbyists and so on to get away from their fair share, take wages, right? There are many, many companies that are making huge amounts of money and yet are not paying wages that are decent living wages. People who work full time for Walmart in the United States still are on welfare even though they are working full time and in fact more. People have to work two or three jobs because the conditions under which they work and the wages that they are paid are not fair. So to me, if you are a corporate leader who cares about the best, you know, doing the best thing, you need to really look at the rules of how you operate and how you fare. Take hiring, right? Look at the look at the corporate boards of those companies. Are they diverse? Are they representative? Are they reflective of their workforce? Um, it is about sharing power, right? Uh, in Germany, for example, you have very interesting rules and, and situations where workers are represented in the highest levels of governance, right? Because they are, so it's not only about shareholders, it's also about workers. So I think, in other words, companies can do lots of charity, and that is a good and important thing. But I think the much more important thing they can do is structural and in terms of power sharing and making sure that the benefits that companies accrue are shared much more equitably in society. And if you look historically, uh, that used to be the case much more. The difference, for example, in wages between the CEO and the lowest paid worker was something like seven times, eight times, 10 times. And today it is 200 times, 300 times. So this deep inequality is where the benefits that business generates uh, are now accruing to fewer people and, and, and need to accrue to much more broadly. So I think if companies are serious, that is the thing that they can do most effectively. Okay, do you, I mean, and I think we've got a question, the next question from Celebrate Our Similarities about, Rakesh, do you think there should be a discussion about those who have, who have been an enjoyed privilege so far will never accept a reduction. And the question's coming up. Um, you know, I've got a load of money. Why am I going to, why am I going to, I don't want to give it up. How, how do you persuade Donald Trump to share his money? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, some people maybe will not be persuaded. And Donald Trump turns out that he doesn't actually have that much money. We will see that once the tax, uh, if the tax documents ever show up. Look, I think. I think the most important thing here is to realize that this is not a zero sum game. This isn't about if we understand the world that in order for black or brown people or people in India as opposed to the UK or women as opposed to men, that it that for women to do better, men will have to do less. For black and brown people to succeed in society, somehow white people will have to go down. That is fundamentally wrong. That it is not a zero sum game, right? There's a wonderful book by a friend of mine called Heather McGee that is about the US context, but I encourage you all to read it in the UK as well. It's called The Sum of Us. And it's it, it just came out a few months ago, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. It's a book that shows that in order to bring racial equality in the United States and around the world, it is not about bringing white people down. And in fact, she demonstrably shows that when you try, when you have discriminatory systems against a particular group, in this case, based on race, everybody suffers. Even white people who are poor suffer. Because what discrimination does, Kieran, is it makes us give up on the public. And when we give up on the public, when we don't want the public to work because we don't want black or brown people to suffer, not only will black or brown people suffer, all of us, including white people, will suffer. And that's the thing. The only people who will be well off are the super wealthy who can somehow privately buy their way out. So when we talk about racial equity or gender equity, we are truly talking about all of us doing better. A society where people who are excluded do better means 
all of us will will do better. So in that sense, I do think celebrating our similarities requires us to understand that we are not all at the same starting point. You must have all seen this image that you know of of uh, two people running the same race, and one person, maybe the woman, has 17 barriers in her way for her to complete the race compared to the man. So if we want the men and women to do equally well, we have to focus on removing the barriers that women face. That is not to say somehow we want women to do better than men. We have to realize that if we want women and men to do just as well, we have to remove the barriers that affect women more so that everybody can end up in the same place. Okay. And then I've got another a good question coming up from that from Charlotte Roby Turner, which I'll read out, and it's about change. A key to change is being creative, but often governments and donors are risk adverse. How can we encourage risk and creativity and honest reflection, which learns from failure? I think that's a really, really important question. Um, the, I, I think it comes down to power. People in positions of wealth and power take risks all the time. Take Silicon Valley, take all these tech companies that have done so well. Google, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, etc. That world is full of taking risks. At Google, every one product we use, right, for Gmail or Google search that works that we all use, there are 100 other things they tried that failed that we've never heard of. But we would have never had the Gmail or the Google search without those 100 failures they were able and allowed to experiment and take risks because people in positions of power, in this case, they're the people who invested in them, the venture capitalists, understood that failure and experimentation and failure are key to success. The problem that we have in our aid sector, in the charity sector, and even in our public sector, is that the people in charge who have the money to give out somehow want to hold that power in ways that do not allow those who are responsible for making a difference to take those risks. So one of the, it, it is really about power. It is about who gets to decide what the rules of the game are. And I think one of the most important things that people can do is to help educate governments and donors as to why risk is important. Um, a, a person I would recommend you read is Maria Mazzucato. She's an Italian-American economist, but she actually spends a lot of the time in the UK, who speaks about the role of government in risk-taking and how government has been so critical to innovation around the world and in risk-taking. And in the charity sector, in the aid sector, there are also lots of people who are writing about how risk-taking is, is crucial. But we will have to educate our donors to understand that this is how, if they want, if they want to be effective, if they want to have impact, if they want creativity and innovation, they need to encourage this honest risk taking. Okay, and then building on from that, um, we've got a question from Beverly Barnett Jones, and it's about how do you, how do you spot the ways to engage with government that can be effective in helping and supporting family and communities? You know, how, how do you do this? So, Sorry, Kieran, if you just, you, you, I lost you for a minute. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. So Beverly Barnett Jones wants to know, how, how do you engage with government in ways that can be effective to help? And, you know, so they're better at helping and supporting families and communities. Again, I really love this question. I think this question, it goes to the heart of how do we make sure that we build systems that work for people? So I think in every country, there are different pathways in which you can engage with government. There is voting, of course, in terms of who we elect. Do we elect people who are more representative and more likely to be caring and responsive to citizens? But, but in order for that to make sense, you can't get engaged just a week before elections or a month before elections. You have to start doing the hard work of helping communities understand the connection between the things they care about and, for example, elections, right? You need, if, if I am suffering from lack of transport or if I'm suffering from lack of security because my neighborhood is not safe 
or we do not have enough wage, you know, we are not paid in a way, a living wage. You start with that and you show people that the reason those problems exist is because our laws and policies are not helpful. You then show that the laws and policies are made in, in a certain way by certain people. And that if we want to change those laws and policies, this is a path where you can actually choose your leaders and then engage with your leaders. So I think that is one thing that I think we need to care about. That in that sense, politics should matter to all of us. Sadly, what you find around politics is that the people who are most affected, who are most hurt by the status quo, are the very ones who are least likely to participate in politics. So the people who end up voting more are disproportionately the better off people rather than the people who need politics to be different. But politics is important, but not the only thing. Once you have your leaders in place, like uh, Joe Biden in the US, they will be as good as we make them be. So it is how you engage. Do you show up to your meetings around your school board? Do you show up to your community meetings? Do you respond to the referendum? And how do you engage in those moments of participation that you have? Do you write letters to, you know, to your, to your, to your MP? Do you write le letters to your local leader? And a lot of the time, this isn't just about individual action. It is about how we organize our communities to come together. Again, if you look historically for any major reform that has happened, it is when people have come together and organized collectively. So get together with your neighbors. Get together with women in your in your in your worker in your at your workplace. Get together with people where you have shared concerns. Educate yourselves, support each other, and then jointly figure out what are the pathways. Not all of you will have the answers, but there will be one or two among you who will know what to do. And if none of you in the group know what to do, one or two of you will know who you can go to talk to that will show you how to do so. In short, what I'm saying, Kieran, is it's hard. It takes a lot of time. It's not glamorous. It can be boring. It can be hard to keep up. But it is that sort of steady, ongoing engagement that makes a difference. And it does make a difference. And when it makes a difference, it can be so fulfilling because not only have you helped yourself, but you have helped put in place laws or policies or systems or mechanisms that will help not only you, but your community and the next generations to come. Uh, so it can be incredibly fulfilling to, to do that. Following on from that, we have a question from James Evans, and he asks, is there now a case to be made for the reduction of central government powers instead of trying to pressure them to a given conclusion? If so, how? Great question, and I think you all are better placed. There must be people in the audience who can, I think, better answer this question than I do, because I'm not as familiar with the details of central government and local government. I, I want to say that both governments ma both matter, right? There is a role for central government. There are certain sorts of issues that are national issues that can't be dealt with at the local government level. So you need a national government for that. That said, I very much believe in the what is what is called in the jargon the principle of subsidiarity meaning where decisions can be effectively made at the local level they should be made at the local level rather than the national level and so i'm a big fan of local government and i do think that there should be a lot of delegation to local government to take care of the things that they can they can take care of in their own because they are better placed to reflect their own realities and their own own, own priorities but the specific ways I, I leave that for others in the audience to figure out what to do. Okay, and then we've got a question picking up on this from David um, Wittrick, and it's about voting. It says, if democratic systems is democratic, as in the first past the post, progressives will always be sidelined. So do we need to change the voting system? I mean, the United States, the UK, there are often built-in majorities for conservative right-leaning governments is this a, is it an issue do we need to look at how the voting system works right so i mean i think the, the first thing i would say is by progressive if we mean it's for people right and the majority of people right then i think one of the important things to try to figure out is how can majorities organize to have their interests prevail one of the crazy things about the world 
is that you have people in charge who are elites, who represent very, very minority interests. And I think they're in charge because they have connections and power and privileges that they use, but also because the vast majority of progressive interests and progressive people are not organized to be able to advance the interests. Now they have they have the odds stacked up against them, so it's not easy. A lot, there's a lot. The system is not made, is not designed for you to work. But historically, we know that when people organize, they can actually prevail. In other words, what I want to try to show is that that progressive governments represent the interests of the majority, and we should try to figure out how we can actually gain power. Now, what is critical here, and this goes, I think, to your question, David is the question of winning coalitions, right? I think one of the most important things around power that we have learned is that you need to create a coalition of interests across different interests that come together to create a, a fundamentally different vision of government that works for people. And you and that kind of coalition building, those coalition politics are very hard to do. Because if you say, I'm a woman and all I care about is 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 a maternity leave, but I don't care about how black people are faring, or I don't care about how poor working class people are faring, or I'd, then we get divided and fragmented and the elites rule and set the rules. But if we come together and build collective coalitions with a shared interest, with a vision where government works for everybody, you can then have majoritarian coalitions that can actually seize power. In a way, if you look again in the United States, what has happened in the Democratic coalition is that it's a coalition of many, many, many different interests that have come together with a shared agenda, even though there are many differences, to be able to prevail, at least in, in this case. And that is, I think, what is needed in the UK as well, these kind of coalitions uh, that, that we need to all learn to do better at national level as well as at the kind of community level. Okay. I've got, right, I've got one more question from the audience and then I have a last question and we are going to wrap this up at three o'clock. So Rahima Caratella has asked, what can university institutions do to support and also how do we involve our inst international students in this work? Great question, Rahima. So universities are hotbeds of, you know, first of all, we have to remember that universities are full of young people and young people have changed the world. Right. It's if you look, it's 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 not people in their 50s who really change the world. It's people in their 20s, you know, teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s. So universities can be great moments of organizing. A lot of my ideas, a lot of my organizing got shaped when I was at university. So I have a huge belief in universities. Universities are also places where you can think and analyze and help understand the world. I think a problem is when universities get disconnected from society when they become bubbles and ivory towers, if you will. And so one of the best things I think that can happen in universities is to get engaged in public interest work. And I love that you talk about international students because universities can also be truly global and rather than parochial, right? These things are connected in the world, right? It is a, it's a global pandemic that we're dealing with. So I think one of the best things universities can do is to show connections between different parts of the world and the different crises we are having in the world and create that solidarity network that can be helpful today, but also kind of set the foundations for an entire life of, of, of public engagement. So I, I think there's a lot you can do. If you look historically, you know, you can learn from other universities and how clubs have organized. You can, you can think about how even the curriculums have changed. So these, I mean, if we had time, I could give you I would just urge you to look at how universities historically have been hotbeds of organizing and social change, learn from it and, and, and kind of replicate that in your own university. Okay, I'm gonna slip one more question in um, before I ask my final question. And this is one that I was given earlier and it's seeing we're doing this remotely, social media has powered many civil society groups through COVID-19 but it's also seen as a source of control and manipulation. How can we make social media a force for good? <laughs> wow, if, if I could answer that question, yeah. um, I, I would be a billionaire. Look, I think social media is like the world. It has the best of everything and the worst of everything. And social, in, in that sense, social media is just a platform 
for all the wonderfulness and all the horribleness that we human beings bring to the world. So I don't think there is any magic bullet. That said, just like in the analog world, just like in the physical world, you need rules and regulations. Uh, so do you. And here, here's where the monopoly power is concerning. When you have the Facebooks and the Googles control so much of the world and essentially are not regulated, then what they will put first and foremost is private interest and private profit over public interest. So I do think the most important thing that social that is needed for social media is actually regulation, public regulation of this. The other thing I think we should also ask is we know historically monopolies are always bad. Why should one company like Facebook control so much? So maybe it's also time to break up those companies. Uh, so you know those are big things that government can do. And you know, I guess individually, in the meantime, one of the things I think everyone should do, if there's one thing you should do, look at your privacy settings. Make sure that when you take part in social media, when you use your computer, you turn off all the settings where they can use your data and follow the data, because that's what really gives them power. Don't give them that power. Educate yourselves to make sure that your privacy settings don't allow okay. them to have that power. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes, a few minutes left now, Rakesh. So the last question for, for you is, Rakesh, you spent 30 years trying to make the world a better place. What is your key learning and what keeps you going? Wow. I think, um, I think the most important learning is, is about listening. Where I have made some of the worst mistakes I have made uh, because I've done stupid things or callous things or things that meant to do well but ended up hurting people is because I was a bad listener, because I used the power of the position I had unthinkingly and did just not take time to listen and particularly to stop and listen to those who are not easy to listen to who are not sitting at the tables I was sitting with and conversely when I did stop and truly listen to what was not only what was concerning but also people's ideas of what should happen and where I made decisions in a way that that tried to take those voices into account and made sure that they were part of the decision making is when I've gotten when some of the most powerful things have happened and a lot of the good things I have managed to do and a lot of the credit and recognition I've received actually has come because I've listened better to people. Okay. And what keeps me going is, you know, right now I'm in the business of, of giving out money. I'm, uh, you know, we fund my organization funds organizations to bring social change around the world. And what keeps me going is, is those people and those organizations. I have the luckiest job in the world because I get to work with and support some of the most incredibly committed, smart, thoughtful, sharp people in the world to bring change. And um, how, you know, what job could be better than that? And I learn from them and their passion and, and how they work uh, in ways that inspire me every single day. That's so you remain going. optimistic. I, I remain optimistic because one, that is the only thing you can be, but because I see every day how people are changing the world. Um, in the end, the world will be as terrible or as wonderful as we make it. And I happen to be lucky enough to be able to work with people who are spending every single waking moment of their life making the world a more just, a more inclusive place. And uh, that's what gives me hope. Okay, well, Rakesh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, you've given up your morning in New York City to join us. And I guess all I've got to say to you is Asante Sana Rafiki. It's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, to, to share your wisdom, keep in touch. And it's been fantastic listening to you. It's been inspiring. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kieran. And thank you, everyone, who, for joining today. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.